Let's look at one of these areas, communication. All of these are really basically video chat. I've been to lots of meetings in bare feet in person, but I think that's not what they meant. They mean video chat by all of these. Video chat certainly is very common today. At least if you interpreted this as done video chat, 100% of you would have said that you do. That was not brought to us by AT&T. That really came from Skype. That was the first and still the most widespread video chat. Skype was first released in 2003. It was developed by a group of three students from Estonia that built a file sharing site, Kazaa, that was a peer-to-peer -a -peer sharing site that, as it was growing, worry about getting shut down for copyright infringement reasons. So teamed up with two other people. One was from Sweden, one was from Denmark, and built Skype. That is what really made video communication take off. There were certainly lots of things in the 90s and earlier that, that could do similar things. But getting the cost down to zero and getting it to work well is what gets things widely used. So we did pretty well on communication. What about commerce? So some of the things in the video look really silly. Using a cash machine, I don't know why they were so excited about cash machines, although I think probably from the 1993 perspective, anything that was a transaction that involved money felt like you need to go to a special place to it. So there's one big innovation needed to make it so you didn't know to go to cash machines to do that. And we've talked a lot about the flaws in SSL and reasons why it's broken, but having secure connections, being able to authenticate on the internet is certainly necessary to avoid going to cash machines. But otherwise, these three are all really about communication on the internet and enabling electronic commerce. How prescient was it to think that we'd do those things in 1993? The web was already around, so this was 1990. Tim Berners-Lee was doing the first prototype. By 1993, web browsers were not used every day, but they were certainly used by people in computer science departments at good universities. So it was not unusual to use the web, and most people were starting to set up web servers. Mosaic became the dominant browser after the CERN browser. The big thing Mosaic added was you could have images in line. This is a very controversial change to that browser. And by 1994, there were thousands of sites on the web, including some business ones. According to Yahoo, which started also in 1994, as two Stanford students started listing interesting websites, there were already at least 20,000 that were known. Tiny compared to what was there today, but if at and had been more prescient, they probably would have thought, instead of needing to go to cash machine to do all these things, something like the web, <coughs> and there were other things competing to be the standard. I think by 1994, it was pretty clear the web was going to win. The one that a lot of people had not done, and there were some comments about, this seems like this is something that should be feasible. We can put an RFID tag on every item in the store. We can have an RFID reader that's going to read a shopping cart at once. Not with perfect precision, but pretty good. Dealing with produce is a little tougher. We'd want to make sure that RFID tags <coughs> are edible if we stick them on fruit. But they still only cost a cent or two, so, so it's probably doable. And some of you pointed out technologies that are doing this. I think there's really a disconnect in terms of the business value of doing it. That is probably why it's not widespread. The cost of having either self-checkout lanes or having people check out is a very small percentage of the revenue of the supermarket, and they're running on really thin margins, so they don't have a lot of money to invest in R&D and do something like this, and whether it would give them a competitive advantage or not, I don't know. The others are pretty commonplace now. But what about travel? So there were a couple examples of travel. Paying the tolls without slowing down, probably need to slow down to go through the easy pass, but it's a lot better than what it looks like in the video where you've got to run a credit card through a machine. I see someone, you don't slow down when you go through easy pass in the arc? Okay. I don't have easy pass, so I do have to slow down and pay the toll, but I see people sort of slowing down. Not needing directions, and this is assuming good navigation devices was maybe more forward thinking in 1993. Where did we start having navigation systems? This goes back to the very early <coughs> days of putting things in space. Sputnik was 1957, first satellite launched by the Soviets. Even when Sputnik was going, people were realizing you could track it by using Doppler effect and getting good information about where Sputnik was. By the 60s, the Navy was putting up a network of satellites. I think there were, there were about five satellites. So it was not that many, but it was enough to help position ships at sea accurately. It was probably the first satellite that you could upload a new program to. This turned out to be important because some of these ended up operating for over a decade. 
So the fact that they could change the code in the satellite was quite innovative back then and quite useful. It did not have a lot of memory, about 48 bytes. This developed through the 60s and 70s. The big breakthrough that led to GPS was this patent by Roger Easton. The work was done probably earlier than this, but the patent's 1974. And it is just a one-person patent, which is pretty rare for something big like this. The main development that made GPS possible was using the phases. So you had a comparison of the phases that you received that could give you very accurate timing differences, and you're also taking advantage of general relativity and pretty deep physics to get these accurate positions from the satellite. It did have nice <coughs> pictures of boats and satellites. In. And this led to the first GPS system with 10 satellites that was used in the Gulf War. You could buy a GPS device for $2,500 that would read the signals from that satellite. Because all of these things were primarily designed for military purposes, and the big motivation was as a tool to guide ICBMs. If you want to make sure your ICBMs go to the right place and can be targeted very precisely, you want to have a navigation. So that was where all the interest in the military funding of this came from. And GPS, until the mid-90s, was really a tool for the military. Part of the reason it was a tool for the military was they deliberately added noise to it to make it so civilians could not use it to get more accurate locations. It was viewed as too dangerous or undesirable to allow civilians and civilian devices, so like this garment that was sold for 2500 would be very inaccurate compared to what was possible because they were adding noise that unless you had a military device with the right key in it, you couldn't get rid of. And then during the Gulf War, there was so much need for client devices that could use GPS to accurately position themselves in order to make it so they could more easily equip more of the military with accurate GPS. They turned off the noise and then decided that it was such a valuable civilian thing that it would be permanently turned off the noise and you could start building navigation systems that rely on this accurate GPS. But this was all within a few years of when the AT&T commercials are, so it certainly was not that surprising, that developed to the point where now it's low enough cost that it's in everyone's mobile phone. We did pretty well on travel. In terms of media consumption, both of these are things that pretty much everyone is doing. The cultural shift of whether you should really have to borrow a book when the book is bits that can be transmitted essentially for free, that really hasn't <coughs> worked out well. The right economic model to make publishers and authors get rewarded when people get their content. But certainly you can get the content, and Amazon was about to start. So this was 1995, Amazon launched about a year after these commercials, they were selling books. And they had a really spiffy website back in 1995. What about these ones? So these were the ones that had the lowest number of people that are doing these things today. Open doors with your voice. Why is no one doing that today? OK, good. Yeah, it's a really bad idea. We could certainly do that technologically. If you have a door that opens with someone's voice, you can record their voice and open their door. There's a great scene in Sneakers about doing this. This is not a technological problem. This was a dumb idea in 1994, and it's a dumb idea today. Maybe you could think, oh, maybe it's a challenge response that you ask someone to say a particular thing rather than the same thing that anyone near their door could record. But that is really not a good way to open doors. So the other ones, keep an eye on your home, is probably something that people who are paranoid about security can do today. And there are really lots of services that will do this for you or sell you a camera that you can put in your home. There are good reasons people might not want to do this. What about the medical history? So why do we not carry our medical history in our wallet? Is there a technological problem with that today? OK, so you certainly wouldn't want the only copy of it to be in your wallet. OK, yeah, so maybe, maybe you're worried about, if you lose your wallet, the privacy of your medical information. But you could, you could encrypt it. Is there any reason we don't do this? OK, yeah, maybe it's not that useful if what you would like is just some token that a doctor can use to get your medical history. You don't actually need the data. But the data is tiny, so you might as well have the data there in case the network is down or you're sick on an airplane or something that's not connected to the network. So it seems like something that should be possible. I think the, the main reason that it is not commonly done today is the medical record keeping is still mostly on paper. Just to get an electronic record out of a doctor today is a really difficult, more of a, a business cultural problem. There are places where hospitals keep electronic records pretty well, not most of Charlottesville. It's still pretty uncommon, despite lots of government incentives to try to encourage this. What we can do, and I don't have my medical history in my wallet, I do have my genome <coughs> on my mobile phone. So that's pretty close to this. That's something that probably everyone who wants to would have today. There's a little bit of fuzziness what it means to have your genome sequenced. 
parts of your genome may or may not be important. And what the, the low-cost sequencing, things like 23andMe do, they're reading a million or so markers that are things that they are identifying as potentially interesting and things that vary among humans, but certainly not sequencing the whole genome. If you wanted to predict this and you looked at genome sequencing, so 2001 was about when the Human Genome Project finished. By then, there'd been two genomes sequenced. One was Craig Venters, who did his independent genome sequencing. One was the one done by the NIH that was a mix of 12 different human they sequenced. So there were two human genome sequenced by 2001. Cost of the whole project was many billions, but the estimate of the cost to just do the sequencing once you learned how and had all the technology behind it was about 100 million. And if you look at those costs over time, they're very steadily decreasing at what we would expect the rate to be from Moore's Law. So Moore's Law, we're expecting every 18 months, the cost is decreased by a half. You could easily make a prediction that that's going to continue. The hard predictions to make are the ones where dramatic things happen that don't stick with those trends. What happened in about 2008 was this went like that. It didn't stay on this Moore's Law curve, decreasing just with computing costs. There were big breakthroughs in mostly the algorithms, some in, in the biochemistry. And this is, remember, a log scale. So this is a big, big difference getting off that curve. And now you can buy machines for tens of thousands of dollars that can sequence genomes. Just to make sure that makes sense, here's a table from a 2010 paper. This captures that important part where the costs really dramatically dropped. So the cost of doing a 40-fold coverage, getting a good, reliable genome sequence, went from 57 million down to 1,500. This is 1,500 in 2009. I blacked out the years when it was 57 million. What year do you think that was? Yes. 2000? OK. Any advances on 2000? 2002? OK. Any advances on 2002? Good. So 2005, any advances on 2005? We're making progress. So it was actually 2007. There are not a lot of things that you buy where the cost went from $57 million to $1,500 in two years. And that is a pretty dramatic, dramatic change. Now you can have your genome, you know, at least many markers of it, the ones that people think matter, either for free or $99 or different prices depending on the promotion, and build apps that operate on it. So. This is certainly something that I think we're just at the beginning of really seeing the impact of it, but has changed dramatically in the last few years.